Wilson? Who's asking? Whoa, 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 whoa. Is that supposed to be scary? Pegging isn't new for me, friendo, but it is for Disney. An absolutely insane series of events has led to Deadpool and Wolverine. After an 11 year film delay to get to that first Deadpool, after the character was horribly ruined in another X-Men film, this nearly $2 billion film franchise only exists as we know it because of a CGI previs footage leak. And all of this before the biggest film studio merger of all time, before a huge cinematic universe, multiversal story in universe, and all before multiple real life friendships in our universe universe allowed this movie to exist. With all the cinematic and real life butterfly effects coming together, all of that brings us to Deadpool and Wolverine. You were an X-Man. Like you were the X-Man. Let's get into it. In the beginning, there was man. Hundreds of thousands of years later in 1976, Ryan Rodney Reynolds came into this world in Vancouver, Canada. He was born to play Deadpool. It just took him some time to get into that suit. Seriously, if you look at Van Wilder, you look at Two Guys, A Girl, you look at Waiting, they are all so Wade Wilson coded. And let's be honest, when Ryan Reynolds starred as Hannibal King in a Marvel movie, before the MCU even existed, this was Blade Trinity back in 2004, he was already playing a sword-wielding, wisecracking Night Stalker. He was pretty much already playing Deadpool. In in fact, there's even a Hello Kitty joke in one scene that he added because of Deadpool. It's in the meat of my butt, just below the Hello Kitty tattoo. Hannibal King was so close to Deadpool that a studio executive at the time on that set literally handed Ryan Reynolds a stack of Deadpool comics and said basically, you're playing this guy anyway, read about this guy. And so Ryan Reynolds' relationship with the Merc with the Mouth was born on another Marvel set before the MCU even existed. Five years after Blade Trinity, Ryan Reynolds was finally given the opportunity to play Wade Wilson himself, and it was in an X-Men movie, no less. Unfortunately, this X-Men movie turned out to be X-Men Origins Wolverine, where the character was so badly mutilated from the essence, the very spirit of who he is, that they literally sewed the Merc with the mouths mouth shut. Not to mention turning him into this weird, all-powerful Baraka mutant final boss, but we will not be reliving that here because I'd like to eat my lunch. This striker finally figured out how to shut you up. Now, actually, one of the only good things to come out of that entire movie is Ryan Reynolds' real-life friendship with Wolverine himself, Hugh Jackman, and they've been an item ever since. Speaking of Hugh Jackman, his next major film after X-Men Origins Wolverine, not counting that X-Men First Class cameo, was actually Real Steel. Now, this was Hugh Jackman and Sean Levy's first ever film together, and another great creative partnership was born, setting the stage years later for Deadpool and Wolverine to be possible. Now, there are a few dominoes setting up everything else leading to the present day, but I wanted to fast forward a couple years to the aforementioned leap. Even before X-Men Origins Wolverine, Ryan Reynolds has spent years, years trying to get a solo Deadpool movie off the ground. Not the least of which being uh, our test footage leaking onto the internet uh, accidentally. About a decade had passed when the stars finally aligned and a pitch perfect, actual, accurate Deadpool footage was leaked and it was at just the right time. It was 2014. We were in a golden age of superhero content. It was the year of Guardians of the Galaxy, of Winter Soldier. Things were firing on all cylinders. What better time to show something new in that same vein? And Kingsman also debuted that year, proving a hunger for R-rated superhero content. So now the stage is set. Ryan Reynolds has been lobbying to play Deadpool for years. Tim Miller has directed a pitch it's perfect short encapsulating the madness of Deadpool. Screenwriters, Rhett Reese and Paul Warnock have, with Reynolds, found the perfect voice for Deadpool. The people are demanding Deadpool. And then Fox, with some important budget caveats, actually let them make the ultimate Deadpool movie against all odds. And then we're rewarded when it breaks all the records. From the studio that inexplicably sewed his f***ing mouth shut the first time comes five-time Academy Award viewer Ryan Reynolds as a man on an e-harmony date with destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you me, Deadpool. No notes from this comic book fan. 2016's Deadpool was hugely impactful for a number of reasons. Box office wise, it became the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. I want you to just think about that. The highest grossing R-rated movie of all time came from a previs leak. It grossed $782 million worldwide and they didn't want to make it for a decade. More importantly, it did that with only a $58 million budget. Now to compare, that year's X-Men Apocalypse budget was three times that at $178 
million. Also in comparison, that movie only made $543 million and it was PG-13. Everyone could buy a ticket. Movies today cost $250 million. What's crazier still is that with that $58 million, when they somehow found a way to make the movie, they were still getting the runaround from the studio. They discovered days before filming that the budget given, that $58 million, surprisingly included their marketing budget. So they needed to trim another seven to $8 million on the day. Do you remember that scene in the film where Deadpool forgets his guns in the cab? That was actually going to be a huge third act gun heavy action sequence, which led to Deadpool saying the iconic line, God damn it. I'm gonna do this the old fashioned way. With two swords and maximum effort. The limited budget for marketing allowed Ryan himself to really have his hand in the marketing campaign. This led to one of the best marketing campaigns in recent memory. The billboards were great, the ads were great, there was stuff that was done for regional TV. It was truly a grassroots campaign for a movie that we don't get with these big temples. He has since won multiple marketing awards and has an entire marketing firm now, and not just for his work, but for repping other companies as well. The name of this huge award-winning marketing firm that spawned from Deadpool? Maximum effort. The limited budget wasn't all a hindrance though. Like any good underdog and like Wade himself, it made the filmmakers get creative with some choices. One of the best of which was to include more scenes between Wade Wilson and Marina Bacharin's Vanessa. This resulted in easily one of the best love stories in a comic book movie ever. One of the great strengths of the film is its beating heart, its ability to be vulnerable, which is going to be essential to Deadpool and Wolverine. As essential as any meta commentary or comedy elements is the heart of Deadpool. It also masterfully uses the fourth wall breaking to not just take pokes at the studio and the budget, but allow the characters to be the perfect bridge between the Fox Cinematic Universe where he began and his upcoming foray into the enormous Marvel Cinematic Universe. But more on that later. I am Marvel Jesus. A quick refresher on some of the important elements that we got in Deadpool 1. It had a fantastic supporting cast including Blind Al, Colossus, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, Joe Pinder, Weasel, and obviously Vanessa, who all truly illustrate Wade's humanity. It is a true R-rated vigilante film that feels almost Tarantino-esque at points, especially in its playfulness with chronology. It's got authentically horrifying villains that torture and mutilate mutants in order to create a living weapon out of Wade. Now in it, Wade Wilson is a cat-loving mercenary who gets cancer soon after proposing to his girlfriend and undergoes experimental therapy that completely mutilates him while giving him insane healing powers. Wade spends the movie hunting down Ajax slash Francis, the man who worked at the program and made him look like, quote, an avocado that had sex with an older, more disgusting avocado. Yeah. It ends on a crashed MCU helicarrier, they snuck that in there, not legally, with Vanessa still very much in love with Deadpool no matter how he looks, cementing their adorable relationship and his having saved the day. This is as much as a walk into the sunset ending as we could ever hope for, for our regenerating degenerate. What are you still doing? Get out of here. Smash got to only two years later and out comes Deadpool 2. In fact, it was greenlit and announced in February of 2016 while the first film was being released. Buzz was that strong. It had a larger budget than the first, but at 110 million, it was still quite small by comic book movie standards of that and our time. It then also became the highest grossing R-rated film at the time, beating the first's own record, and it still sits at number three to this day. No one can beat Deadpool, but Deadpool. It became the highest grossing film in the very successful X-Men franchise, which is absolutely insane with an R rating. This franchise had been running for like 15 years and the R rated ones win, it's crazy. Now this time around, Ryan Reynolds got writing credit alongside Reese and Warnick with the Fall Guy and Atomic Blonde and John Wick co-director David Leitch at the helm. So in Deadpool 2, after being much more of a good guy and fighting organized crime for two years, Wade and Vanessa have decided on their anniversary that they want to have a baby. My IUD. A bomb? She's then killed soon thereafter, right before his eyes by an assassin hellbent on revenge. This obviously makes Deadpool become completely despondent, even suicidal, but he can't take himself out even with more and more elaborate attempts thanks to his healing factor. Now there's some great beats in here, even lashing out at the very concept of Wolverine for stealing his R rating with 2017's Logan, but overall it's a very tragic comedy, which is Deadpool. Well, guess what, Wolby? I'm dying in this one too. Colossus then brings Deadpool to the expansion and tries to recruit him to the X-Men, which plants so many seeds for multiverse jokes right there. Now, he reluctantly joins because he believes that's what Vanessa would have wanted, but completely botches that first mission at this mutant re-education center slash orphanage when he ends up killing a member of the staff upon discovering they abuse kids. He and Colossus are immediately arrested and we meet Cable in prison, and he is played by none other than Thanos himself, Josh Brolin. From there, lots of rad action occurs. Deadpool decides to form and lead his own X-Men, X-Force. 
Isn't that a little derivative? X-Force is quickly dispatched leading up to the final battle, but Deadpool and Cable save the day and time travel, very important, is introduced. Now in a post credit scene, Wade is seen stealing Cable's time travel device and going back to fix things. He saves Vanessa, he saves X-Force, he kills X-Men Origin Wolverine's Deadpool while asking Wolverine to come back through clever editing and archival footage of that movie. That wasn't Hugh. He used footage from the movie that nearly ruined the character to bring back Wolverine. He even killed Ryan Reynolds before he could play Green Lantern, giving us all that gift. You're welcome, Canada. Not only will this moment with Wolverine obviously be a factor, the ramifications of Cable's time travel device I think will directly set up the events of Deadpool and Wolverine. 2018's Once Upon a Deadpool is effectively a re-release of Deadpool 2, but one set at Christmas time due to it also being a Princess Bride spoof. It even featured Fred Savage himself being read the story of Deadpool 2 by Deadpool, filtered through the prism of childlike innocence. I'm a And nobody man. does childlike innocence like you, Fred, nobody. This allowed for a PG-13 cut of Deadpool 2, which I see as a great way to test audiences for Deadpool's future in the MCU. There's a lot more to be said about Deadpool 2 and a half, but as it pertains to Deadpool and Wolverine, I think it's really worth noting the heavy use of fourth wall breaking and its ability to show how funny Deadpool can be when censored, but only as long as it's intentional. In the future, when Deadpool teams up with another character in a PG-13 movie, the bleeping can be super effective. We don't need an R-rated Avengers. I'd like one, this allows for both. Are you bleeping yourself? You bet your voice and little I am. Our last stop before we get to 2024's Deadpool and Wolverine is discussing Deadpool and Wolverine themselves and their relationship in the comic books. In the comics, Weapon X created Wolverine through violent experimentation, dehumanization, and by bonding an adamantium skeleton to Logan. In most continuities, that very event led to Wolverine inadvertently being responsible for the creation of Deadpool himself. That same shadowy group also created Deadpool through violent experimentation, dehumanization, and by bonding Wolverine's healing factor to Wade Wilson to save him from that cancer. Continuity varies a bit when it comes to when their first official meeting was and how their first official meeting was, but almost every time they collide in the comics, the pair fight and then eventually and inevitably come to an agreement, even at times becoming reluctant friends. That friendship is generally Wade Wilson thinking of them as friends and Logan begrudgingly accepting Wade Wilson being around. Uh, go f yourself. This, of course, is very much like Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman's own online personas and seemingly at times their friendship in our universe in real life. Hey, Hugh, you want to play Wolverine one more time? Yeah, sure, Ryan. But at the end of the day, in the comics, they share a reluctant bond over Weapon X and that trauma, just as Ryan and Hugh share trauma over being an X-Men Origins Wolverine. It's also worth noting that Deadpool creator Rob Liefeld put Wolverine and Deadpool together years after creating Deadpool in part out of his own love for Wolverine. In Wolverine issues 154 and 155, written and illustrated by Liefeld, he paired the two, and this became one of their most iconic fights of all time. And from some of the images we've seen of Wolverine and Deadpool fighting in the film, it looks to be a shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the fight spanning those two very specific issues, further cementing them in comic book history and all from the pencil of the man who created Deadpool out of his love for Wolverine. Now, if this all sounds crazy, it is. If the continuity sounds messy, it is. If you can't tell when when they met, how they met, what's going on. That is fair, it's comics. I appreciate you keeping up so far. Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. Now we've looked into the past, let's dive into the future and discuss Deadpool and Wolverine set to drop this July 26th. Oh, and by the way, you can literally buy your ticket to the movie right now. Do it, I believe in you, be an overachiever, get after it. Let's start just as the characters did with the Marvel comics. So many roads have led to Deadpool and Wolverine, but I think it's still gonna surprise a lot of people what they might pull from. I think this might in fact be a loose adaptation of this comic run called Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe. We are Marvel. <laughs> Hilarious, you're Fox. In it, Deadpool successfully takes out all of our favorite heroes within the Marvel Comics universe. Now I think a fascinating way to adapt that story, especially with all the multiversal shenanigans going on in the MCU, is to effectively have Deadpool kill the Fox universe. Now, this wouldn't by any means be a direct adaptation of this, because I don't think killing them in a mercenary or malicious way works for the MCU version of the character, but I do think that Deadpool will inadvertently, through a number of universes and incursion events, cause so much chaos due to his reckless time turner use, it does kill the Fox universe. Or I do think someone convinces him, and it is almost that mercenary thing, where what if someone hires him to clean things up and it's not actually cleaning things up? We know how the TVA does. We've all seen Loki season one and two. Your little cinematic universe. 
is about to change forever. Now this allows us to have all the cameos we have ever dreamed of, like those cameos we'd hoped for with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. This also serves as a well-deserved and long overdue swan song for the mutants. They helped us get to the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the first place. They deserve to help us bring it into the next phase. Now this is a full circle moment, 25 years in the making, and it leads right to Secret Wars. We might see a few surprising new cameos in Deadpool and Wolverine, including fan favorites like Channing Tatum finally donning Gambit's trench coat. We might see Chris Evans, and instead of wielding the shield when he enters, he might surprise everyone and say flame on and be reprising his role as Johnny Storm from the Fantastic Four. Now, rumor has it we'll also get Jennifer Garner back as Elektra, and if she's back, I cannot imagine Ben Affleck's Daredevil is too far behind. Now, the possibilities are nearly endless, and that's just the fun, shiny, blockbuster side. On the other side, as I mentioned at the very top of this video, Deadpool is equal parts heart and comedy. And what I think will be truly beautiful in making a movie where the universe potentially ends is our potential to say goodbye to these mutants we grew up with before we bring in a new version of them into the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the first place. I want Storm to get her due. I want Cyclops to get his time as a leader on screen. I want comic accurate costumes instead of black leather. I want both teams of X-Men that Deadpool himself and alone is unique in dealing with. Remember, he literally acknowledged which Professor X, McAvoy or Stewart? I want to see him with both. He's already aware of both universes and has been for years, making him uniquely poised to be the great connector of all things Fox with all things MCU. I am not X-Men material at all. It also presents a very unique opportunity for Hugh Jackman to say goodbye to Wolverine without sacrificing his already powerful and bleak goodbye to Logan in Logan. It also gives him the chance to actually don that iconic costume and cowl and for us to finally get our lethal weapon moment between the two of these iconic comic frenemies. I am soaking wet right now. Now, I do think Wolverine in 2017's Logan that died will stay dead. In fact, I think we'll see him dead. In fact, I think Deadpool is gonna go on a hunt to find a Wolverine willing to help him. I think the Deadpool and Wolverine we saw in that new trailer is a brand new Wolverine. I don't think we've met that Wolverine yet. In fact, I think we're gonna go through as many universes as they can, and we're gonna get variants of Wolverine like Madripoor's own Patch, who I think we saw in that first trailer, and I think it's gonna be played by Daniel Radcliffe in that iconic white suit, and that we may get even more variants perhaps even played by a Henry Cavill, but we'll see. Now, I also think through Mr. Paradox, who, by the way, in the comics is actually a variant of Owen Wilson's Mobius from the Loki TV series, will also bring us to something akin to Battleworld. If you remember in the Loki series, the place at the end of time seems to show up in that first Deadpool and Wolverine trailer, and in the second one, it looks like we see Eliath also from the Loki show. So I'm wondering if all of that brings us into a world where Doctor Doom might in fact reign supreme again, setting up the events of Secret Wars. I personally think the Fox universe helped us get here, and I think it's a really unique and wonderful opportunity, decades in the making, to allow this character, one of the only ones in canon who could actually be this self-aware to give them an actual goodbye. Not only will it be a spectacle, not only will it cause the internet to lose its mind with cameos, but there's so much potential for genuine sorrow, and most importantly, for genuine closure. What a perfect way for the entire Fox universe to get their own No Way Home, like Spidey did back in 2021. For us to say goodbye to such a formative time in our own lives. You need to just keep living. So now, you know all that nerdy goodness. It is time for you to go get your tickets and go see Deadpool and Wolverine in theaters July 26. 25 years led to this. Let's fucking go. And we'd love for you to rate and review the film on RottenTomatoes.com and be a part of that conversation as well. I'm Koi Jandro. Please follow me here at Koi Jandro. And I really hope you enjoy the movie and hope you enjoyed this video.